Hello, welcome to our Nihon Tonobi Beauty of Japanese Soul. My name is Hisashi Saito, owner of Seiko Odo in Ginza, Tokyo. In this sixth video, we are visiting Kamakura to explore the roots of the Soshu tradition. Kamakura has unique cultural appeal for locals and for visitors alike. This appeal is linked with its roots as a seat of the Kamakura Shogunate, established by Minamoto no Yoritomo in the late 12th century. Kamakura also played a paramount role in the history of Japanese swords as the birthplace of Soshu tradition. And the emergence of Soshu, along with its subsequent influence on the further evolution of Japanese swords, is closely tied to the historical context of the city. Today we'll be joined by Robert Hughes, owner of Keichodo, a dealer in Japanese swords, and also a long-time resident of Kamakura. Robert, very good to have you with us today. Well, thank you for the invitation. I'm pleased to be a part of this production. We'll begin our journey here at Hongakuji, the resting place of Masamune, arguably the most celebrated smith in the history of Japanese swords. We're standing in the precinct of Hongakuji Temple right now. And no serious study of Soshu swords would be complete without inclusion of the significance of Hongakuji into the life and death of one of the most celebrated swordsmiths in Japanese history. That is the legendary Masamune. Robert, we're looking forward to your introduction. Let's go and explore Hongakuji. Yes, let's take a little walk. So when we're thinking about the significance of the monument, there's a very important text on the back side. And that text firmly establishes the connection between Nichiren and Masamune. That Nichiren ordained Masamune into Buddhist priesthood. Our second stop is here in front of this tomb. Now the exact date that this tomb was established is not known, but it is known that this tomb was erected by Yamamura Tsunahiro, and the Tsunahiro swordsmiths traced their lineage back to the great Masamune. Below the stupa, carved in stone, is a direct reference to the year of the rat, which we can trace references back to the year 1348 and that this memorializes Shinyu Niken and that's the posthumous Buddhist name of Masamune. The third point of significance in our investigation today brings us to these grave sites. According to temple records here, these ancient memorial stones in a very early shape, typical of the Nambokucho period, this marks the actual grave of Masamune. Beside it, Sadamune, which demonstrates the familial connection between father and son. Additionally, moving this direction, we find the Yamamura family tomb, connecting the Tsunahiro Smiths through a geographic placement of grave sites to build a connection in this lineage, all found here within the precinct of Hongakuji. Fascinating how history is buried in the smallest corners of Kamakura. I understand this is site of Masamune's workshop. 
So this location is very important actually in unpacking our story about Masamune because um, early records from the 1600s began to show that this location, which is Ogigayatsu, Ichi no Jusan no San, 1-13-3, was recorded as not only the workplace of Masamune, but also his residence. And uh, although this may have been relocated, this shrine is known as the Masamune Inari Shrine. And it has relevance to the idea that not only did Masamune live and work here, but he also prayed here in the process of creating his sword masterpieces. The birth of the Soshu tradition is obviously inseparable from the political environment of the time, and it was the regent Hojo Tokiyori who invited the acclaimed swordsmiths Aotaguchi Kunitsuna from Yamashiro and Ikimonji Skezane and Saburo Kunimune from Bizen to Kamakura to establish what would become the roots of the Soshu tradition. It's said that Kunitsuna's son was Shintogo Kunimitsu, the teacher of Masamune. So today, to embed our story, of the birth of the Soshu tradition and the tales of Masamune, we have to consider the climate of the times or the zeitgeist. During this history, there was one very prominent family in Kamakura that influenced things, and that is the Ashikaga family. Originally, they were united with Minamoto Yoritomo. So their presence in Kamakura lasted from the Kamakura period through to the Muromachi period. And during that period, for 200 years, their residence is this location. Earlier, we talked a little bit about the roots of the social tradition with Awataguchi Kunitsuna, Saburo Kunimune, and Ichimonji Skizane. We also talked about the influence that Soshi would have on subsequent evolution of Japanese swords. What can you tell us about this? So, at the time of Masamune, we know that, and many, there are many different accounts about this, that he had some top-level students. And this is right at the point that we discussed earlier, um, the beginning of the Nambokucho period. So, what emerges is that of the so-called Jutetsu, and, and this list also needs to be organic because it was revised many times. It's only since about the 1500s that the current 10 prominently listed members were actually proposed. So there's been revisions over time. So what we have to look at is whose work is it that has the closest resemblance to Masamune and the early influences. And so I'm proposing that, you know, Go Yoshihiro and Shizusaburo Kaneuji are the two that deserve to be studied in close detail. So we're talking now today, um, I'd like to focus specifically on Kaneuji, primarily because I have some samples of his work and I, I'm particularly taken by it. Um, I'm interested in the idea that Kaneuji originally was working as a Yamato Tegai swordsmith and left that area and was relocated to Kamakura and spent time and developed these Soshu skills here and then transferred back to what is now modern day Gifu prefecture to Shizu and at that time um, you know his work today in sword circles is referred to as Shizu, Shizu work. And then work by his descendants, and some of the, there's several, their work, um, they were actually relocated to, to Naue. So their work is now identified as Naue Shizu. Um, today, I would like to offer for viewing um, a, a blade that is recognized as uh, Naue Shizu. 
And um, if you look closely at the sword, you're going to see evidence of Kaneyuji's movement. So within the blade, there is very strong masame screaming throughout it. Okay, that's, that's part of the early studies and work associated with Yamato Tegai. So from there, we see something else emerging here. There's a, a sort of notare influence on the hamon. Okay, that is not specifically something that would have emerged through Yamato Tegai. So where did that influence come from? So we see that influence from the studies with Masamune. And then inside the Hamon, there's Hataraki that would never have appeared in Yamato Tegai pieces. So that is also evidence in this sword. So this sword is a, is a wonderful candidate to study the tradition and the transition of these works and the flow. So you've brought a few more examples related to Kaneyuji. Would you like to introduce them? Yes, so again, this fits into the theme of our discussion where we're tracing a flow of work over a historical period of time and over geographical locations. So. The first example we talked about um, representing the work of um, an earlier period, but post Shizu work, so Naoi Shizu. So in that direction, later on, the descendants, of course, their work is often identified and collectively can be referred to as Den Naoi Shizu. So the second sword here um, has that designation. Now clearly there are remarkable differences between the Naoi Shizu blade and the Den Naoi Shizu blade. So um, it stands to reason that there's a definite time transition. And what you see in the second reference blade, the Den Naoi Shizu, is the disappearance of the Masame. And the hamon has changed dramatically, and so um, there's a little more, like visibly, it's moving into a higher state of activity, shall we say. Now, there are two additional blades there. Now, these are actually signed blades, Nijime, two-character Kaneuji blades, but um, there's about a 200 year time gap between the Den Naoi Shizu blade and the appearance of these signed Kaneuji blades, which would put them into the late Muromachi period. But carrying this theme, there is still visibly traceable features that appear in this work, especially in the Tanto. Um, there's amazing, but where we're going with this is the whole Mino tradition emerged out of this work. So you've got Soshu influence creating a whole new tradition. So in our tour of Kamakura today, we visited many historical sites and it may make you very proud as, as a resident to live in such a rich cultural environment. Uh, our journey today, of course, took us through various parts of Kamakura and towards the end, we visited a spot that represent, you know, mark the former residents of the Ashikaga family. And so they had a very big role in the history of Kamakura and that lasted until the 1500s actually. And then their power started to wane. And the last daughter of the uh, Kanto Kubo Ashikaga, um, she married and her husband died, and so she remarried an Ashikaga, and together they relocated to Tochigi Prefecture, and they changed the name of their family to Kitsuregawa. And so that has some impact on today's discussion and study of the sword, because um, 
the Naoshizu blade that we were looking at came with this origami. And there's a reference on here to the Kitsuregawa family. So it makes me happy to know that um, not only do I live embedded in this history, but also I've been able to uh, collect some items and uh, basically preserve some items that also represent this long and beautiful history. Thank you for watching this sixth episode of Nihon Tonobi Beauty of Japanese Soul. I hope this provides a flavor for the rich history behind Japanese Soul.